Good morning and thank you for holding. Welcome to the Cons Inc. conference call to discuss earnings for the fiscal quarter ended January 31st, 2020. My name is Michelle and I'll be your operator today. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, you will be invited to participate in a question and answer session. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. The company's earnings release dated April 9, 2020, was distributed before market opened this morning and can be accessed via the company's investor relations website at ir.cons.com. During today's call, management will discuss, among other financial performance measures, adjusted EBITDA, adjusted net income, and adjusted earnings for dilutive shares. Please refer to the company's earnings release that was issued today for a reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to the most comparable GAAP measures. I must remind you that some of the statements made in this call are forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal security laws. These forward-looking statements represent the company's present expectations or beliefs concerning future events. The company cautions that such statements are necessarily based on the certain assumptions which are subject to risks and uncertainties which could cause actual results to differ materially from those indicated today. Your speakers today are Norm Miller, the company's CEO, and Lee Wright, the company's COO, and George Bashar, the company's CFO. I would now like to turn the conference call over to Mr. Nick Miller. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning, and welcome to Con's fourth quarter of fiscal year 2020 earnings conference call. I want to start today's call by reviewing the rapidly evolving COVID-19 crisis before turning the call over to Lee and George, who will provide additional details on the quarter and our response to the current economic and business landscape as a result of the COVID-19 situation. The COVID-19 health crisis has had a significant impact on our daily lives, and our hearts go out to anyone who has been impacted by the illness. We are taking decisive action to respond to the near-term challenges that have occurred since the crisis began. The health and safety of our customers and employees has always been our top priority. We are closely monitoring federal and state guidelines to ensure we are doing our part in helping prevent the spread of the illness while focusing on keeping our stores, distribution centers, and service operations open to provide essential products and services that help our customers adjust to in-home activities and lifestyle. As of today, Nearly all our showrooms are open, and I am pleased that we can continue supporting our communities by offering necessary home goods and affordable financing programs. We are in regular contact with our state and local officials to ensure our stores remain open to provide essential products such as refrigerators, freezers, washers, dryers, air conditioners, and home office products. Critical to our response to the COVID-19 crisis are the actions we have taken over these past four years to improve our balance sheet and credit operations, which provides us greater flexibility to successfully operate our business through this period of uncertainty. For over 130 years, Cons has provided essential products and services that improve the lifestyles of our local communities while supporting customers in good and bad times to our affordable financing options. In fact, our credit business started over 50 years ago to help Texas oil workers finance essential products for their homes during difficult market cycles. We are proud of the strong relationships we established during challenging periods as our products, financing options, and support help our customers recover and our communities rebuild. I am extremely pleased and grateful with how our team has responded. I want to thank all our associates for their dedication to these uncertain times. Demonstrating our commitment to our associates, I am pleased to announce we have temporarily increased wages by $2 an hour to support our frontline employees through this crisis. In addition, we are temporarily reducing the salaries and compensation for certain business leaders. This includes a salary reduction of 20% for our named executives and Section 16 officers and a 25% reduction in my salary. Throughout our history, Con's business model has has demonstrated its resiliency. While our fourth quarter credit and retail results were disappointing, our near-term objective is focused on navigating the unprecedented challenges created by the COVID-19 crisis. 
We remain committed to helping our customers, employees, and communities in this time of need. Our experienced leadership team, profitable operating model, and strong balance sheet provides us with the necessary platform and resources to respond to this challenging period. So with this overview, let me turn the call over to Lee, who will provide more details on our fourth quarter operating results and the specific actions we are taking to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Thanks, Norm. Our fourth quarter financial results did not meet our expectations, and we are disappointed with the performance of our credit and retail segments. During the fourth quarter, we experienced declining credit trends associated with high-risk vintages, an increase in new customers, and difficulties in collection efforts related to the implementation of our new loan management system. As a result, we experienced an increase in first payment defaults, 60-plus day delinquencies, and re balances. In addition, higher charge-offs during the fourth quarter impacted our credit spread, which declined to 790 basis points for the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2020, compared to 890 basis points for the fourth quarter last fiscal year. In late March, John Davis, President of Credit and Collections, resigned from the company, and I have temporarily assumed his responsibilities until a replacement is found. The difficulties and collection efforts associated with the loan management system are largely behind us, and we are focused on improving underwriting and pursuing additional programs to enhance our yield. Looking at our fourth quarter retail results, we believe tighter underwriting standards that we announced during the third quarter impacted same-store sales by approximately 3 to 4% in the fourth quarter. The challenging market conditions within our consumer electronics category we mentioned on our last call also impacted same-store sales by approximately 6 to 7%. In addition, we continue to see some residual impact from Hurricane Harvey during the fourth quarter, as well as the continued impact new store cannibalization has had on same-store sales. Offsetting some of the retail weakness we experienced in the fourth quarter were strong sales of appliances, accelerating e-commerce sales, and the contribution of new stores. I am encouraged that we were able to maintain retail gross margin above 40% for the fourth quarter and full year, despite lower retail sales. While our fourth quarter retail and credit results are disappointing, we remain confident in our long-term opportunities. We are committed to the previous growth strategies we have communicated over the past several quarters, which includes growing our store base, increasing our e-commerce sales, expanding our product categories, and leveraging our credit offerings. However, over the near term, we are adjusting our priorities to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. So let's look at the actions we are taking in more detail. We entered this challenging period in a strong financial position. As our near-term priorities adjust, we have revised our fiscal year 2021 store expansion plans and now plan on opening between six and eight showrooms this fiscal year, which is a reduction from 16 to 18 showrooms we previously announced. We have also decided to delay any new showrooms associated with our future Florida distribution center to next fiscal year. From an operational standpoint, in-store shopping hours have been temporarily reduced across our store base to provide flexibility for our employees and to allow more time for additional clean within our showrooms. We are closely monitoring CDC and federal guidelines promoting a safe and healthy environment for our customers and employees. In addition, as required in certain jurisdictions, we are limiting the number of customers in our showrooms at one time and practicing social distancing. Meanwhile, the investment we made throughout fiscal 2020 to our e-commerce, digital, and mobile platforms has played an important role in our ability to interact with customers more effectively while improving our online user experience and providing customers with important updates and account access 24 hours a day. As customers adapt to in-home lifestyles, we have recently experienced an increase in demand for essential home appliances and home office products, which have partially offset weaker demand for more discretionary categories like furniture and mattress. From a credit perspective, the lessons we have learned from past disasters has provided us an operating framework to quickly respond to customer operational, and performance issues. For example, we utilize third-party collection companies with assets around the world, which will enable us to quickly increase capacity as the volume of delinquencies rise. In addition, many of our internal collectors and third-party resources can work remotely, which enables us to continue to operate this important function. To control delinquencies and charge-offs, we have implemented a series of underwriting changes starting in March to remove high-risk applicants, selectively increased down payments, and lowered 
credit limit to improve performance of loans originated during this period. The investments we've made in our credit platform allows us to actively monitor portfolio trends, and we will continue to evaluate further underwriting changes to manage risk based on performance indicators. Finally, we have launched a number of payment relief programs to help customers through the hardships they are facing as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. To conclude my prepared remarks, while we made a lot of progress during fiscal year 2020 and saw our full-year credit spread expand to 920 basis points, we experienced challenging retail and credit results during the fourth quarter, and we are disappointed with our recent performance. We believe our experienced leadership team, profitable operating model, and strong balance sheet, as well as the essential retail and credit products we provide customers, will support us through the unprecedented challenges the COVID-19 health crisis has created. We are working hard to support our employees, customers, and communities throughout this period, and I look forward to updating investors on the progress we are making as we respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and improve our credit and retail performance. Before I turn the call over to George, I also want to thank our 4,100 associates across the 14 states in which we operate. On behalf of the entire leadership team, thank you for your hard work, service, and dedication through this challenging period. Now let me turn the call over to George to review our financial performance. Thanks, Lee. On a consolidated basis, revenues were $413 million for the fourth quarter of this fiscal year, representing a 4.6% decline from the same period last fiscal year. Gap net income was $0.17 cents per diluted share compared to $0.91 cents per diluted share for the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2019. On a non-GAAP basis, adjusting for certain charges and credits, net income for the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2020 was $0.20 cents per diluted share compared to $0.96 cents per diluted share for the same period last fiscal year. Adjusted EBITDA was $35.8 million, or 8.7% of total revenue for the fourth quarter, compared to $67.7 million, or 15.6% of total revenue for the same period last fiscal year. Reconciliations of GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures are available on our fourth quarter earnings press release that was issued this morning. Looking at our retail segment in more detail, total retail revenues for the fourth quarter were $315.3 million, a 7% decline from the same period last fiscal year. Retail segment operating income was $35.7 million, compared to $54.7 million for the same period last fiscal year. The decline in retail segment profitability was primarily a result of lower retail sales and higher SG&A expenses associated with a greater number of new showrooms and additional investments we have made to support our growth. Turning to the credit segment, finance charges and other revenues were $97.7 million, up 3.8% from the same period last fiscal year. The credit segment loss before taxes was $28.6 million, compared to a loss before taxes of $16.2 million for the same period last fiscal year. The larger segment loss, credit segment loss, was primarily due to $13.9 million year-over-year increase in the provision for bad debts in the credit segment as a result of an increase in the incurred loss rate, as well as higher first payment default and delinquency rates. With this overview on our fourth quarter financial results, I want to discuss our current financial situation and the actions we have taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We entered this challenging period in a strong financial position with diverse funding sources and ample liquidity. We have more than two years until our high yield notes or revolving credit facility mature and we recently completed a $486 million ABS transaction in November. As a precautionary measure to maintain financial flexibility, in mid-March, we borrowed an additional $275 million under our existing revolving credit facility. And as of today's call, we have over $270 million of cash on our balance sheet. We also have approximately $120 million of availability under our revolving credit facility, bringing our total cash and immediately available liquidity to approximately $400 million as of today's call. We believe that our available cash and liquidity and history accessing the capital markets give us a distinct advantage as we navigate this uncertain economic environment. From an investment and operational perspective, we are delaying or eliminating certain non-essential capital expenditures, more aggressively managing working capital levels, and cutting SG&A expenses. 
For example, related to capital expenditures, we have significantly reduced the number of new showrooms we plan to open this fiscal year, including delaying our Florida expansion. It is important to note that our stores remain profitable, even with significantly lower revenue, as a result of the variable cost structure of our retail stores and high retail gross margins. On average, our showrooms break even with a reduction in retail revenue of nearly 60% from fiscal year 2020 levels. We believe that our retail operating model provides us with additional flexibility to navigate challenging economic periods, including most recently during the 2008 and 2009 recession. We also expect to benefit from several provisions in the recently passed CARES Act, including accelerating certain tax deductions, utilizing net operating loss carrybacks at higher tax brackets, and delaying the payment of certain payroll taxes. In addition, the CARES Act has a number of unemployment and employer benefits that will help provide temporary relief to to many of our customers. As a note, as you can see in the press release that was issued this morning, we have revised our unaudited financial results for the third quarter of fiscal year 2020 to reflect the correction of an error. This error has been updated in our historical financial results and did not impact full-year financial results for the year ended January 31, 2020. Before providing a final comment on CECL, I want to mention that, like many other retailers, and given the near-term uncertainty surrounding COVID-19, we are suspending our quarterly financial guidance. As we have communicated over the last couple of quarters, We were required to adopt CECL, the current expected credit loss accounting standard, on February 1, 2020. We currently estimate that adopting CECL will increase our total allowance for bad debts by 40% to 60% based on the portfolio composition and economic outlook as of February 1, 2020. As a reminder, CECL is simply an accounting change and does not affect the cash flow or fundamental economics of our business. However, we believe that the combination of adopting CECL and the economic uncertainty surrounding COVID-19 will increase the variability of our provision for bad debts in the future and could impact quarterly segment profitability as a result of higher provisions for bad debts. With this overview, Norm Lee and I are happy to take your questions. Operator, please open the call up to questions. Thank you. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to move your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we pull for your question. Our first question comes from the line of Rick Nelson with Steven. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Uh, good, good morning. Wait, uh, I know you don't have first quarter guidance, but uh, if you could speak to anything that, that you're seeing, you know, we're two weeks uh, you know, to quarter end in terms of the sales, you know, the credit book uh, delinquencies, you know, be- before and after uh, the COVID outbreak. Sure, uh, Rick. I'll start on the uh, same store sales trends, and then uh, Lee can touch on the credit uh, side of the house. Uh, on the same store sales, prior to the uh, the coronavirus hitting, um, we were seeing same store sales trends in, had improved from the fourth quarter trend. Um, once the virus hit, uh, we saw a modest improvement from that trend initially in the same store sales, but a significant mix shift. Um, away from more discretionary purchases, if you will, furniture and mattresses, and towards uh, more essential purchases, appliances, home office products. In the last several weeks, um, I I will say it's been fairly volatile, but um, we've seen things for sales settle in at approximately down 30%, um, driven by several factors. Obviously, uh, as we mentioned, our reduced hours in our showrooms, about 60% of our stores have limited occupancy of how many customers and or associates can be in our stores at any one time. Uh, Also, as we mentioned, uh, it was about a month ago, we started a variety of credit tightening efforts in anticipation of um, credit pressure uh, with the coronavirus 
and uh, we're estimating that that impacted about 16 per- 15 to 16 percent of sales, at least the underwriting changes that we've done to this point. We continue to examine the portfolio um, on a daily basis and determine, um, you know, and, 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 and be comfortable with where, uh, where our underwriting is at. Um, the customer traffic in the stores are down slightly more than the same store sales trend um, as customers are coming into their stores from an intent to purchase standpoint. It's probably at a higher level uh, than it typically is, um, so we're converting more of the customers that come in. Applications online are up dramatically uh, year over year uh, by 30% uh, plus. Um, I will say the dynamics are changing uh, by the day and by the week. Uh, as I said earlier, a high degree of variability. For example, the shopping patterns are very, very different than what they were pre-coronavirus. Um, during the week, we get much heavier traffic uh, than we do on the weekends. The weekend, the traffic is dropped off. Uh, dramatically pre-coronavirus and uh, stronger patterns uh, during the week, relatively speaking. So, um, you know, it's a it's, it's a very dynamic environment, one that we're obviously monitoring on a regular basis. Um, we, we feel fortunate that 95% of our stores uh, are open um, and able to operate, um, and our associates have responded uh, I can't stress enough in, in such a manner to be able uh, to, to safely serve our customers, take care of our customers with these essential products that we provide our communities, and the way they've responded has been uh, has been pretty remarkable and uh, testament to the quality of the workforce that we have. So, uh, do you want to touch on the credit yeah. side, Rick? Yeah, Rick. On the credit side, obviously. Uh, you saw the increased our provision because our allowance was increased uh, for the fourth quarter uh, due to what we are seeing in the portfolio uh, for future charge-offs that we believe are going to roll through. So we saw that. I will tell you we were having an excellent tax season. Uh, the economy was, was humming along prior to the complete outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, obviously, post uh, many of the uh, uh, shelter-in-places and basically shut down of the economy, uh, we saw collections activity uh, decrease. I would tell you that started to come back. We're pleased with the CARES Act, some of the stimulus programs uh, that's gone out and the unemployment benefits. So, uh, as Norm said, one of the benefits of having our showrooms open is that 25 to 30% of our customers have historically made payments in our showrooms. So, that's enabled us to continue that. But obviously, from a collection standpoint, uh, we have people not only still in our call center still working, but we also have work from home capabilities. So we're actively continuing to collect, um, and we have seen from a collection standpoint things stabilize a bit, uh, and we're certainly very focused uh, on making sure that we're collecting from our portfolio during this time period. Yeah, because of our diverse um, both in-house and third-party collection groups, um, you know, and, and the ability from a flexibility standpoint to be able to work from home, um, about 50% of our collectors are working from home now uh, outside of our showrooms, and then we've increased collection efforts uh, with the third party as well. Uh, we feel confident right now at the at the turns we're getting and the, and the connects we're getting with customers. Uh, the issue is um, then having the the, uh, the cash and how that plays out in subsequent months makes it very difficult to predict what will happen with the uh, with the portfolio, but. Suffice to say, we understand uh, how critical it is to stay connected with our customers, the recency from a payment standpoint, um, which is why, a big reason why we want the stores open, not just, uh, um, not just to be able to deliver those essential products, but also for those customers to be able to um, be able to make payments, which they are continuing to do at a, at a, significant, at a significant level in the stores. Um, but... Um, very difficult to predict what will happen with the portfolio going forward with uh, with a number of unknowns we have. Thanks for the color. If you could speak to the the ABS uh, market, uh, you know how that's looking, and you know when you anticipate to go to market so again. I know you just uh, completed a deal in November, but uh, to go forward potential. 
door. <laughs> Rick, this is George. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, as of today, we have approximately $400 million of, of cash and immediately available liquidity on, on our balance sheet. Um, to put that in context, when we drew down on the ADL uh, about a month ago, we had just over $400 million. So over the last month, we've, we've essentially used uh, relatively uh, little cash and available liquidity. Um, to answer your question specifically, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, the ABS market was, was dried up uh, completely. Now we're starting to see uh, prime auto deals get done um, and, and more activity in the ABS market. But as we sit here today, um, with $400 million of, of cash and <clears throat> liquidity uh, on our balance sheet, we've got enough uh, liquidity to last us uh, for, for the, the, the near term. And finally, you said the restatement. Is that uh, one time catch up to the, you know, the accounting change, or is there go forward uh, implications that we should think about for the current year? No, it's, it's just a flip between Q3 and Q4. Gotcha. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Kyle Joseph with Jeffrey. Please proceed with your question. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, thanks for answering my questions and for for all the the color you the color you provided um, given the volatility we've seen recently. Uh, first, uh, George, just just going back to Cecil. You know, we've seen some headlines about potential relief uh, related to Cecil. I, I think it ties more to banks. Uh, are there any potential options to delay CISO, or is it it's going to go in into effect kind of consistent with the color you gave us last quarter? Uh, no changes. Unfortunately, the, the language in the CARES Act was specific to uh, depository institutions, and um, there were some conversations about it being broadened, but as we sit here today, uh, our intention is to adopt CISO consistent with the requirements in the first, first quarter. Sure, and then just a, one follow-up from me related to to credit in the post diesel world. Of, um, you know, can you give us a sense for? I know you guys mentioned you're you're still collecting, but what, you know, what options do customers have that have been impacted? to we anticipate sort of the the reage balance uh, increasing, kind of similar to what we saw post Harvey, and and just give us a sense for how you um, you know see that impacting. CQs, uh, reage balances, and then as well as the balance sheet in the P&L. Yeah, hey, Kyle, it's Lee. So obviously it's still early. We do have uh, relief programs for our customers. Obviously we want to balance the fact that these are ongoing customers with us. We want to show compassion during a time period of great financial stress in their lives. At the same point, obviously uh, we've extended credit and need to get paid. But we do have uh, relief programs for our customers um, and similar, as you said, to what we did in Harvey, where we did a, a uh, Goodwill DA relief program, uh, that being said, people do have to reach out to us directly. It's not a, uh, an automatic uh, uh, granting to every single person. We want to make sure that they call us. We understand their exact circumstances and what's happening, uh, but we do have programs uh, for them uh, to provide them relief. How that's going to roll through, obviously, we've got to watch very carefully. It's still pretty early for us to see um, what transpires there. But clearly, as Norm talked about, we're very focused on collections. Uh, we understand the importance of it, and we have a lot of different uh, ways and means to stay recent with our customers and still get some cash, but also show the appropriate compassion to them. And in, in addition to that, Kyle, we also have some programs where the customers are paying a certain amount of cash um, in, in an effort to, to keep that recency with them. We are giving them some benefits from a concession standpoint to, to ensure that we're staying connected there and, um, um, you know, keeping that cash flowing in. So, uh, but, again, all of these, as we mentioned, are driven by the customer. We're not doing anything unilateral across the portfolio. And we will track this going forward, um, both COVID uh, um, uh, forbearance programs and not be able to hopefully give some color on what's happening with the forbearance program part of the portfolio as well as uh, the remainder of the portfolio. I appreciate that. Thanks. One last one for me, too. Uh, you know, given um, COVID and the economic 
economic disruption we've seen uh, in going back to the last financial downturn. Can you give us a sense for, for you know, how the financing options change and, and sort of the penetration rates of, of the third-party financial firms you guys use or third-party financing firms you guys use? Yeah. Hey, Kyle. That's uh, me. And, um, well, look, clearly it's one of the benefits that we have as a retailer, the fact that we have a broad spectrum of, of financing options for our customers. If you want to pay cash or credit, that's fantastic. Uh, obviously, we have synchrony with some best-in-class, no-interest financing options to our higher um, uh, credit score customers. And then, obviously, we have our core cons credit programs for our customers. And then to the extent uh, that it makes more sense, there's a lease on option. So, Unlike a lot of other retailers, we have the full spectrum. I will tell you what we have seen and, and what we talked about in our investor decks and other investor meetings is during the time of stress, what we do see is we see uh, customers start to fall somewhat. So to the extent that they may have been able to use cash or credit or use alternative means of financing, they may fall into our bucket. So we have the ability to provide them cost financing, or if they fall out of us, we've got lease to own. So, um, I, what we have seen, and Norm mentioned, the number of applications that have come to us via web has been up uh, a very large amount. So we've seen people looking for credit. Obviously, they understand uh, the importance of credit, and that's one of the beauties of our retail and credit model put together. And, and as you know, Kyle, being in the, in the credit space um, for a while and understand that um, as in 2008, 2009 with the subprime market, um, you see a tightening at the higher end, so that actually creates, ultimately, as you work through the environment, um, you know, typically some sales opportunities for okay. you know, fall into our uh, uh, into our core cons credit. But as we mentioned, we having credit options across the spectrum enables us uh, ultimately to serve those customers wherever they fall on the spectrum. Got it. That's very helpful. Thanks very much for answering my question. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Brad Thomas with KeyBank Capital Markets. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Good morning, uh, Norm, Lee, and George. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on, on some of the recent trends and the tightening. Just to make sure I heard, heard you right, Norm, I think you said that, that you had settled out closer to 30% down more recently on same-store sales. And I think you said that you thought changes in underwriting may be hurting you right now by 15 to 16% on same-store sales. Did, did I hear that right? You did. Those are the correct numbers as we sit here today. Okay, great. And, and, and so just as we're thinking about how the rest of the year plays out, uh, if the current underwriting setup has you – running at a 15 to 16% headwind. I guess, can you help us think about, um, you know, how dynamic that, that underwriting scorecard might be? What, what might might make you change things back to the way they used to be so that some of that headwind goes away? I'm just trying to separate out how much your same for sales might be hit by traffic issues and social distancing issues versus some of the changes in underwriting you all are putting into place. No, I understand. What I would say, Brad, is geez, I, I wish I could give you uh, – um, I wish we had uh, more concrete uh, information we could give you in projecting what's going to happen. I will tell you, we look at, we're looking at the underwriting, our first payment default, uh, what's happening, early delinquency trends in the buckets on literally a daily basis, cash collected. Um, so those changes that we've done, that 15 to 16%, They've been in three or four different um, iterations where we've done a variety of things, credit limits, um, uh, higher, higher risk credit bands, and, and we, we're doing that based on what we're seeing with the portfolio on a daily basis. So as we, we as Lee mentioned, we've seen the portfolio, you know, come in a more stable place here recently from a collection standpoint. So that gives us encouragement with uh, – some of the stimulus things that are going on. And frankly, as we connect with our customers and they understand the importance that we provide, because in essence, although we're not a line of credit, customers understand from doing business with us through the years that when they pay us and they, they're in good stead with us, um, they have the ability to come back and borrow from us in the future for these essential products and, their, and services in their homes. So um, keeping that connectivity with them 
and, and the importance for the customer to continue to pay us so that we can continue to serve them in the future are important talk-off points for our collection teams and our collection efforts that as we see that stabilize, that will ultimately determine what we will do with the portfolio going forward. But for us to predict that right now, uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to do. Gotcha. That's, that's helpful, color. Um, and then I guess uh, just a question that, that we've been getting about the business is how to think about, you know, the puts and takes on cash flow and and liquidity. And it's, it's clear that you all are being proactive about making sure you have ability to, to um, you know, access your revolver and liquidity. Um, you know, if, if we were to continue to see the sales running down at this 30% level, um, I guess could you help us give us give us some uh, color around what sort of levers you can pull in terms of inventory reduction or perhaps tightening even more so that you, uh, um, you know, uh, don't need cash as much? Um, any more color around that would be helpful. Yeah, hey, Brad, this is George. I think the first thing that, that's important to, to point out is that the liquidity dynamics of our business are different from other traditional retailers. When sales slow for us, we continue to collect on receivables on our portfolio, but we're purchasing less inventory. So it, it actually is uh, positive, can be positive from a liquidity standpoint in the short term. Uh, in addition to that, the, um, you know, we've taken actions to uh, improve our working capital levels uh, and cut expenses. So the combination of those two things are the reason why our liquidity has basically remained unchanged in, 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 the, in the last uh, month since the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, started. And it's an area, Brad, that we continue to look at from an expense standpoint, uh, from a capital standpoint. You know, we're, we're, um, now our stores are open. Our collection centers are – we're still delivering into homes. Our service teams are still out servicing our products um, if they break down. Um, so our organization, although a number of folks are working remotely, from a headquarters standpoint, um, in the field, we're, we're you know, our, our objective here is to get whatever revenue we can to fill the needs from our customers and continue to be able to collect and service our customers. Um, and, and whether through, uh, you know, through that way, we'll – uh, will mitigate our need to have to take more draconian measures is our hope on an expense standpoint. Gotcha. That, that's very helpful. Thank you all so much, and, and good luck here. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Brian Nagel with Oppenheimer. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Brian. Thanks for taking my questions, and I appreciate all the color so far. So I had a few topics I wanted to dive into here. Um, first off, and I guess this is mostly for Lee, uh, we talked about in the press release and in prepared comments the, the, the issues with the, the loan management system. I just want to understand better what happened there, and then probably more importantly, is, is, that, now, is, is that issue or those issues now corrected? Yeah, hey, Brian, good morning. Um, so... Just not to go into great detail, but to add some color. As you know, we implemented two new systems uh, last year, um, one of which was our loan management system where we made a change. Uh, the implementation of that uh, created some difficulties from, you know, as we looked at our ability uh, to see and, and interface with our actual collection system and the visibility that we had was more muddled than we would have liked. So from a nimbleness perspective and ability to act as quickly as we would have liked, uh, we weren't able to do that. Um, and that was what caused some of the issues that flowed through and uh, that we talked about on the call. And those are predominantly, at this point, uh, you know, we, we those have been corrected and we're, we have the visibility we need to be able to effectively collect um, at the rate that we would expect going forward. Okay, got it. Then the second question, um, you know, obviously, with, 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 with the COVID crisis, and there's a lot, a lot of moving parts here, but, but before we were talking, before the crisis, we were, we were discussing and talking a lot about the, the dynamic within the TV business, you know, and that the, the, the more functional, higher-priced TVs have come down, uh, come down in price significantly, 
and that really impacted uh, the value, so to say, that uh, that Khan's added to that market. Again, lots going on there. How, how should we think about that that, dyna- that dynamic now? Is, is that beginning to correct itself, or is, is this COVID crisis potentially lengthen that that issue as, as TV manufacturers maybe are not introducing as quickly as they could have new and more functional TVs? Yeah, uh, Brian, I, I, what I would say is I don't know if it's lengthened it. It certainly has exacerbated uh, the issue um, with the latest NPD data that was out uh, from uh, two weeks ago. We're showing uh, uh, ASPs on, from a national standpoint on TVs were under $300, uh, which it has never – I mean, that's the lowest point it has ever been because as what's happened is TV units are actually up slightly, um, but ASPs across the board are down, and they're down even at a greater extent at the higher value TV because Walmart, Costco, uh, the big box guys are open. That's where – and the online, um, that's where – a significant majority of the TVs are being purchased as we sit here today. So uh, in the absence of, you know, 8K, you know, which is coming out this year and and some other new functions and and functionality TV-wise, depending on how that plays out with the COVID-19 and gets introduced into the stores, um, I I don't expect that to abate um, or, or to improve in the short term. Um, but we believe longer term, this is just the cyclical nature of the, the TV electronics business. This occurred in the past before, but, you know, my assessment would be that the COVID-19 crisis is not going to help us in that area. Our ASP is still over $1,000, but it's down, um, you know, 20-plus percent, continues to be down 20-plus percent from uh, prior year. Thanks, Mom. That's helpful. The, the, my final question, you know, just looking forward, it's, it's clearly uh, no one knows you know, how, how long this crisis will persist. But as you think, you know, you know, you know the business extraordinarily well. I mean, how, how, I mean, assuming that the crisis does abate in the not too distant future, how should we think about the recovery potential for cons, you know, both from a retail and a, and a, and a credit standpoint, you know, as, as the as the shock or as these headwinds as begin to 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 lessen. Yeah, I would say um, on the credit side first, there'll probably be more stress in the credit portfolio initially, depending on um, you know reages and the performance of those customers. If the employment comes back um, relatively quickly, and and you know one one of the things about our our core customer at least is you know, they make about uh, around $47,000, $48,000 a year, and um, they live in recession, um, you know, uh, all the time, basically. They live paycheck to paycheck. And interesting enough, even when we were in the very early stages of the COVID and, and the shelter-in-place in uh, orders were had not been issued yet, but you were starting to see the media pick up in early March, we were already seeing our cu- customers – cut back from a tax season standpoint um, and, and reserving cash because they understand how to do that very, very well, and they're very, very nimble in that environment. So, um, you know, in the short term, the, the credit portfolio is what will be, you know, if, if we have stress in the business, that's where it will come from. We believe ultimately it will create, you know, more opportunities from a retail standpoint as credit gets tightened by those up- uh, uh, higher end in the spectrum, and now with our full credit offering from GE all the way down to, to lease to own, you know, uh, we believe it will create more opportunities ultimately from a retail um, uh, sales opportunity uh, going forward as, as this base. Got it. Very helpful. Thanks again, and uh, best of luck here. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of John Ball with Cecil. Please proceed with your question. Uh, good morning, and thank you for your uh, time and detail. Uh, I was wondering if we could maybe start with with, uh, with John Davis' departure. He was an important hire. You build up a team around him. Um, what, you know, in hindsight, 
Um, I'm just trying to get some color for either what went wrong with his decision making or execution versus, you know, external factors with, of which there are, of course, many. Just start there. Yeah, hey, John, it's Lee. Good morning. Um, look, obviously, I uh, can't respond directly to his resignation, but clearly, as I said in my prepared remarks, not happy with our credit performance in the quarter, and obviously we increased our allowance as we, you know, foresaw future charge-ups increasing, um, and obviously we had a, a material weakness and a restatement, um, and the operational issues that resulted from that uh, certainly or that created that uh, certainly didn't make us happy. So, I mean, that's probably the, the most that we can go into. I think what I would add, though, is um, uh, we did uh, build up a, a deep credit team, so we do have a team uh, that certainly has been built up, and um, and that's why we have been able to make uh, continue to make underwriting changes. You know, uh, we continue to make those obviously and uh, monitor very closely with the team that we have in place. So, so you're right; um, he was very important, um, and he did add value uh, while he was here. But we still have a full team, and obviously, we're actively looking for a replacement, and we'll continue to go forward. And obviously, I've stepped into that role and uh, working very closely with the team going forward. And then could you perhaps tell us, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, losses are up, uh, FPDs are up, delinquencies are up. Um, is, is there a way of looking at that and saying how much or, or all, perhaps, probably not, is due to, quote, new customers, or are you seeing deterioration with existing uh, customers as well? Yes, so, so John, again, as I said in the prepared remarks, obviously we had higher risk advantages that we had originally originated uh, in the summer, and that was even through Q3. Obviously, we made some underwriting changes in the middle of Q3. All that takes time to bake as it rolls through. Uh, and we certainly have seen an increase in new customers. We continue to, to talk about that, and we've always talked about new customers are riskier than, than existing customers, and it takes time to sort of settle them out and bake them. Uh, look, from a percent of the overall portfolio at the end of the fiscal year, new customers were 40% versus 38% last fiscal year. Um, and probably more importantly, what we even saw in Q4 was uh, new customers were approximately 40, uh, 43% versus last year they were 34%. So the, the new customer mix um, that we saw, as well as the higher percentages, and then I talked about the difficulties in the collection efforts related to the implementation of our loan management system, all three of those things had caused some issues, and then you overlay with the COVID-19 uh, situation. So clearly we're monitoring very closely. We're working through it. I think we've made the right moves um, from an underwriting perspective to make sure that who we are extending credit to is going to pay us back, even with uh, some of the COVID-19 issues rolling through. Um, but, again, uh, I would just tell you we're very focused on, on monitoring all of that. Let me, let me highlight two things, too, if I could, John. One is just the – to amplify the comments that Lee made, the, the credit team is in a very different place uh, than it was four and a half, five years ago. Uh, the depth of resources, the quality of the team, the sophistication of the team is very different than it was four and a half, five years ago um, when the credit business was losing a couple hundred, $250 million. The, 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 second piece, uh, uh, the second piece of it is the credit business itself um, is in a very different place than it was four and a half, five years ago. Um, with that, as we move to, and in the third quarter, saw a thousand basis points of spread, and, and even in this fourth quarter with, you know, with disappointing performance, still at about eight, 790, 800 basis points of spread. Um, we have part of the reason that I've talked about for multiple years, that thousand basis points of spread, is to give the company the flexibility during challenging, difficult times to weather through uh, things that are outside of our control. And it has put us in a place, even with disappointing results coming out of the fourth quarter, to be in, in a very solid position going forward to weather not only the, um, uh, the deterioration of some of the credit performance in the portfolio, but also the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as we weather through that here in the coming weeks and months. Um, thanks for that. And my last question was on the the, the least to earn piece, which I think was in a six percent 
plus range for the January quarter. Um, as you tightened here again in March, um, underwriting, would we expect to see that um, funnel um, increase and, and be a, a bit of a an offset maybe to the pressure you're seeing? And then likewise, what happens sort of to the high end of your, you know, your, your uh, synchrony piece? Uh, where do you see the mix, in other words, of all the three underwriting buckets? Well, I mean, it's still early in the, in the process. What I would say is we are seeing um, uh, uh, lease to own uh, balance of sale increase. We're also seeing synchrony increase as well. Um, so on both ends of the credit spectrum, uh, cash and credit is also, uh, you know, people paying by cash and their credit card is also up, uh, you know, initially out of the gate as well. So, um, you know, and for us, all of those are like cash customers. So those are very positive from both a cash flow standpoint and a credit portfolio. And, and last, if I could take one last one in, maybe for George. Um, you mentioned the last month being a, a kind of a break-even cash flow period. Is there some seasonal um, unusual benefit from the tax season that makes of all the other metrics of your business are similar and, you know, the next month uh, a, a different cash flow number, that's that's a kind of a stable number. I, I don't expect that our portfolio, that our cash position is, is going to remain uh, flat here. I mean, I think it, as a general comment, and I think you know this, John, when, when sales slow for us, um, our, our business can generate cash. Uh, you know, obviously, we're, we're monitoring our, our cash and liquidity position here uh, here closely, and, and, and we believe that we've got uh, enough cash and available liquidity to, to last us here in the near term. Okay. Thanks, and good luck in these tough times. Thanks, John. Thank you. Our final question comes from the line of Bill Ryan with Compass Point. Please proceed with your question. Uh, good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Um, First question, uh, to what extent, if any, have, you know, some of the states have implemented various collection moratoriums, uh, and if that may be impacting uh, um, your ability to do collections or perform the collections. And related to that, um, you know, uh, there's obviously a, there's a lot of uh, deferrals going on, forbearances and various programs that all the credit companies are offering. Um, how has that impacted the way you are recognizing interest income in the income statement? And then uh, the second question is just on SG&A. I think everybody's kind of modeling a little bit north of or had been modeling a little bit north of $500 million in SG&A for fiscal 21. You've obviously got some efforts to bring those expenses under control and bring them back down a little bit. And you've pulled dialed back on your uh, new store openings. How should we be thinking about that number, if you can give us a little bit of thought on that uh, going into fiscal 21? Thanks. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bill, it's Lee. So with regards to your first question on states and restrictions or moratoriums on collection efforts, um, obviously each of the states, and it's really only a handful that have done that, uh, and typically what we have seen, at least for the states that we are actively in, it's uh, restricted third-party collection efforts. Um, obviously we're a first-party collector, so it really hasn't impacted us much at all to the extent that there is anything uh, else. For obviously, we're complying by uh, any of the state regulations or, or, or statements that they've made out there. But it really hasn't had a significant impact at all uh, on us in particular. But obviously, we're monitoring closely. So we, yeah. Those states that we do, we pull it back. We yep. do have some third party that does collections. And, and in Nevada and states where there has been some impact, uh, it, it's not been material. We just pulled it back in house and done it ourselves. Yeah. And as it relates to your your question about uh, SGNA, uh, obviously as we've gone from opening 16 to 18 stores to six to eight. We incur upfront expenses associated with, with opening those new stores. Uh, so that by itself will reduce our SGNA expense uh, lower than it otherwise would have been. Uh, in addition to that, we've taken a number of proactive measures to cut costs. Um, and so we, you should expect to see SGNA expense lower than it otherwise would have been. Now, obviously, we, we've not put, put out uh, Q1 guidance um, and, and don't expect to put out four-year guidance here. Um, but, but I think just as a directional sense, that, that, that's how I would think about it. And, and what I would say, Bill, is we, you know, this is the time frame when our next earnings call is fairly close, relatively speaking, because of the year-end 
So uh, early June, when we report for the first quarter, our expectation is we would be able to provide, uh, even if we're not giving some guidance, be able to provide some direction from an SG&A standpoint on that activity that we've taken. Okay, and uh, just the final part, uh, question was related to interest income recognition. Um, you know, obviously, all financial institutions are granting uh, various waivers, deferments, forbearances. Um, has that impacted or will it impact the way you recognize interest income on uh, loans that receive uh, some of those uh, deferrals? No, uh, and it, it depends on the nature of the concession. As we sit here today, uh, extending a, a loan is consistent with uh, some of our policies that we have already. That does not in and of itself change the income recognition on, uh, on the account. Okay, thanks for taking my questions. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I'd like to turn the call back over to Mr. Miller for any closing remarks. Thank you very much. First, we appreciate uh, the participation in the investors and your question and your interest in the company, especially at all times, but especially during these uh, unprecedented times. And uh, we look forward to uh, providing you an update uh, in a couple of months on our first quarter results and performance. Have a great day. Thank you. This concludes today's teleconference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation and have a wonderful day.